good afternoon and good evening to all the respected uh, guest speakers uh, chairperson discussion panelists and all the delegates uh, i welcome you on behalf of acnsm neurosurgeon committee for today's another yet interesting uh, education webinar which we conduct for sole purpose of education of am neurosurgeon and we conduct this webinar on every second and fourth sunday uh, the evening 7 pm japan time so for today's session, we have Professor Kosaku Amano uh, from Japan, uh, from uh, Department of Neurosurgery, Tokyo Women's Medical University. And a uh, uh, young neurosurgeon speaker, we have Dr. Khalil al uh from Canada. And uh, uh, our chief patron is Professor Yoko Kato, who is the president of ACNS Society. The chairperson for today's session is another expert of uh, 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 neuro-oncology, uh, Professor Professor at St. G.S. Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. The discussion for today's is uh, Professor Serik uh, Duis, du, du, Dusen B from Kazakhstan and Professor Alem Zagdar Wozniak, who is the president of the Ukrainian Society of Neurological Surgeons. And uh, the moderator for today's session is uh, Dr. Chen Jiyua from Japan, from China, uh, Dr. Artikel Islam from Bangladesh, uh, Dr. Heba Zos from uh, Egypt, and Dr. Oraz uh, Rahim from Turkmenistan. So um, without any delay, I would request for us, Professor Yoko Kato to say a few uh, opening words uh, for to encourage the young leaders. Professor Yoko Kato. Uh, welcome all of you. Thank you very much for uh, support the YNS webinar. Uh, that is uh, two guest speaker is uh, uh, outstanding uh, good uh, speakers. Uh, Professor Amano is a good friend of mine. He is an uh, uh, expert of the, uh, especially the transpenoidal approach, especially the pituitary region. And uh, the other one is called Khalil. Is uh, he is uh, a WFNS minus our co committee member. Uh, I think uh, it's getting busier in, in the near future. So, uh, thank you very much, and uh, Alexander. Uh, I'm very happy to see your face. So you had a very Thank you. Nice time. Thank you for the invitation. Very nice time in India. I think you enjoyed uh, the Indian Congress and also the Abhita Shah. As uh, always, you uh, supported our uh, webinars. Now is a uh, Heba is with us now. He maybe uh, I think she can speak Japanese now. I think <laughs> yes. Konbanwa. <laughs> Konbanwa. Konbanwa. Eva Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's please start. So, uh, I request Professor uh, Kosaku Amano, who is the professor uh, at Department of Neurosurgery, Tokyo Women's Medical University. Uh, and uh, he's going to speak about innovations of transpenoidal surgery for pituitary tumors. I would request Professor to share his screen and start his presentation, please. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Okay, oh, just a moment. Check the time. Okay, my topic is uh, innovation of transpenoidal surgery for pituitary tumors. Uh, since 2006, I only played a uh, uh, pituitary tumor, uh, including uh, open surgery and uh, transpenoidal surgery. Uh, 80 to 90 percent transpenoidal, but uh, I also do the open surgery. Uh, first of all, uh, we must uh, think about the historical background of transpenoidal surgery. Uh, it had started uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, Schroffer and Kutzing and other uh, doctors started the PSS. But uh, Dr. Kutzing, at that time, very famous doctor in Harvard University, he said PSS was so high mortality, so high complications. So he said it must transfer to the uh, transcranial surgery. So at that time, uh, PSS is once out of gone, out of, they cannot uh, do that. But uh, 30 or 40 years later, uh, 1960s, uh, Dr. Hardy, uh, he introduced the microscope and the X-ray uh, to the uh, TSS. And it become uh, safe and uh, uh, so 
worldwide operation. Uh, I met him uh, uh, through Revan. Uh, this is a uh, 50 years uh, memory of TSS started. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he was dead uh, last uh, November, uh, 89 or 19 years old. And the uh, 1990s, endoscope was introduced to TSS. And uh, since then, uh, transfernal surgery changed uh, drastically. Uh, my personal career of TSS, uh, I started uh, in 1990s on the microscope, but my mentor introduced the endoscope. But at the time, endoscope was just assisted, mainly microscope, and uh, gradually combated the endoscope. And uh, 2011, uh, I fully combated the endoscope uh, because 2011, I introduced the high definition type endoscope. Uh, everybody knows the advantage of uh, endoscope. It's a panoramic view. Uh, microscope only can see this region, but uh, endoscope, we can get such a wide range of panoramic view. But it's, I think it's not an uh, advantage, but uh, uh, we need other innovation. So uh, we need a surgical innovation of TSS in instrument uh, technique and complication avoidance. Uh, these instruments, uh, these innovations lead to uh, current endoscopic TSS. Uh, it was my revolution. Uh, high definition type rigid endoscope. Uh, we use a salt uh, 211, we introduced uh, HD endoscope. Uh, it has uh, almost seven times higher pixel than conventional type. It can detect the microvascular on the petri ground, uh, arachnoid membrane on the uh, surface of the endocarinal sinus. And we can see uh, flow of out of BC here. Yeah. There is a flow of RBC. Microscope cannot such a small structures, but endoscope, uh, if I use HD and close up to the object, we can uh, get a such a beautiful views. So uh, another advantage, it's mean uh, HD endoscope uh, advantage is a close up view. Uh, if we uh, close to the object, uh, we can see such a close up view. And furthermore, we in, uh, insert into the supracellar region, subventricle, like this. Uh, deepest side, we can see such a, also, uh, we can get the in, uh, detail of the uh, structures. So we use such functions of HD endoscope. But also endoscope has the disadvantages, uh, movement restriction. Our TSS is narrow and deep corridor, and the endoscope itself become an obstacle. That's a big problem. So we have to develop the dedicated instrument for TSS. Uh, we developed this uh, instrument. Uh, this is a noble flexible forceps, forceps, and this is a malleable suction attachment, and this is a bending ring curate. Uh, this instrument is uh, so effective to remove the far lateral, uh, far superior uh, tumor. Uh, we can uh, see this region, but the uh, conventional instrument cannot reach this region. So those are very uh, useful. And another innovation in technique uh, at the tumor removal, uh, we have to think uh, how to preserve surrounding structures and also how to remove superior and lateral extensions. Third innovation is a complication avoidance. These eight uh, complications is uh, important, but uh, especially uh, CS leakage is uh, most common and uh, important uh, complications. Uh, we have established the strategy to repair the serotal tear, and of these uh, nine uh, strategies, these five, uh, three is most important. Uh, suturing technique, uh, its purpose is promoting a union of the dura, uh, making attention to the dura, 
and if we can, a water type project. But the most important purpose is, I think, practice. Uh, suture in the TSS is, everybody knows, very difficult. But if you can suture the dura at transcendental surgery, you can do everything. Uh, you can do every very sensitive procedure. At open surgery, everybody sutures the dura. Why not do in TSS? And after stitching, uh, you have to not tighten, uh, not to make outside of the nostril and deliver it to the uh, deep side uh, near the cell floor and tighten the knot uh, firmly like this. I made this instrument. And uh, I think the head batteries is very useful, uh, effective to prevent the delayed serious leakage. Uh, this is, I use the septal bone uh, three months later, it become like this, adhere to the surrounding bones. And if the wide uh, region we have to repair, we need uh, uh, several uh, septal bones. And this is a gasket uh, method. It's, I think, most uh, effective uh, use of the of method uh, of the heart batteries. And the pedicle flap, I ever know this. Uh, nasal septal flap, it's changed the extended transverse surgery, but I seldom use it because it changed the uh, anatomy of the uh, inside of the nostril. So we routinely use the uh, spinal sinus mucosal flap. Uh, spinal sinus mucosa peeled off from the cell floor and just recover, uh, that's all. And uh, I think it's promote the natural healing process. Uh, I recommend this. Uh, procedures. So innovation technique, uh, the tumor removal, how to preserve surrounding structures, how to remove superlateral extension. Uh, let's think about uh, surgical indication for PGT adenoma. Uh, Non-functioning adenoma, uh, visual impairment, everybody knows, to improve visual dysfunctions. And I add the hormonal dysfunction in non-functioning adenoma to improve or preserve pituitary functions we can do if we use the HD endoscope. And the functioning pituitary adenoma, I think this is a adenoma, but the different tumor from the non-functioning adenoma because the uh, 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 purpose is different. Its purpose is hormonal access uh, to be uh, uh, to be less the hormonal access to make hormone excess normalized. It's the purpose of the surgery. So how much tumor should we remove uh, non-functioning adenoma 90 to 90%? It means that uh, in order to improve visual impairment, I think 50% uh, is enough. But to prevent post-operative intratumor hemorrhage, we must remove more than 90%. However, to prevent partial hormonal dysfunctions, we must remove less than 99%. On the other hand, non -functioning, functioning adenoma, we must remove the tumor 100 to 101% uh, to accomplish the complete removal and home normalized. So how to remove the tumor 100 to 101% in functioning adenoma? Uh, we should remove the tumor should capsule. This is a originary uh, a normal pituitary gland and compressed by the tumor and uh, uh, normal gland become more fibrous, and such a fibrous tissue included the tumor cells, so we must remove it. And also the uh, tumor in the cavernous sinus, we must remove. Uh, Cross grade three and four cases is uh, uh, very difficult to remove. Uh, I show you the representative case. Uh, this is a cross four a GH producing adenoma uh, tumor embedded into the cavernous sinus. Uh, at first, remove the tumor in the uh, center, and then now I change to the 30 degrees, and the father arterial tumor was removed. This is 70 degrees. This is the ICA, and using the angle suction, I remove the tumor. This is ICA, and uh, here now I remove the tumor behind the ICA, uh, under controlling the tumor, uh, breathing. And now peel off the should capsule, and also in the uh, in the membrane of the camera sinus was removed. This is a final view. 
and tumor was completely removed, and the uh, collision consensus was cleared, and no GH deficiencies. Next case is the uh, CNOSP 2 or 3. Uh, it looks easy, but I think more difficult than previous case. Because this is 70 degrees endoscopic view. Here, uh, there is a uh, middle membrane of a cavernous sinus. We must intentionally remove the, such a membrane to reach the uh, tumor in the cavernous sinus. And also, uh, this case, uh, cavernous sinus was still survived, so uh, so much venous breathing. So I prepared the zeratin sponge surrounding surgical fields and immediately packed it to the uh, cavernous sinus and keep going on the tumor and uh, membrane removal. And this case also uh, completely removed and the protein consensus was uh, appeared, uh, accomplished. And after these uh, innovations, uh, overall remission rate of GH omer uh, improved gradually. And especially uh, CROSP uh, grade three and four, uh, before HD endoscope, 26%, uh, but after that, or uh, nearly 70% of CROSP grade three and four, uh, GH omer was completely removed. Uh, next is a non-functioning adenoma. This is eight years old of a prexy case. Tumor packed side ventricle. Maybe uh, 10 years ago, I choose the open surgery in the hemsic approach, but uh, he had uh, a heart disease. And as Oje said, uh, you must finish the operation within two hours. So we choose the uh, TSS. Uh, this is a, a 45 degrees endoscope, look upward. And uh, this is a tumor in the south ventricle. Uh, tumor include the uh, include the uh, hematoma and become so fibrous. So the uh, tumor in the south ventricle was removed as embryoc uh, fortuitary. And here we can see the south ventricle from a mono and uh, populate from MCH here, and tumor were also totally removed within two hours. But such a case, uh, much rated and the tumor uh, in both the uh, arteries and the optic nerve, uh, we can use the tumor only TSS nor open surgery. So we do uh, combined surgery, TSS, and uh, this case, uh, Andrew in the hemisphere approach, uh, did uh, simultaneously. At that time, we needed two team like this. In this case, uh, tumor uh, subtotally removed, and uh, no complications after the surgery. Uh, since 2008, uh, I try to improve and preserve pituitary functions. So this case, uh, moderate size of uh, no function at the normal heat, uh, demonstrated the uh, uh, disturbance and the mild pituitary dysfunctions. At first, I try to find the uh, cleavage between the tumor and normal gland here. But at the close-up view here, we found another membrane between the tumor and normal gland. So here is the new cleavage. So this is a shoot capsule. At the uh, non function adenoma, uh, we try to preserve this uh, uh, capsule. It is originally a uh, normal gland. So only the tumor uh, was removed piece by piece. And at the end of surgery, like this, such a membrane become uh, sick and red. It means the uh, normal pituitary gland becomes uh, revascularized. After the operation, uh, tumor removed, your disturbance improved, and also uh, pituitary dysfunction improved. After such operation, uh, indication was changed. Uh, please think about this case, 44 years old man, he demonstrated a, a central high blood rhythmism, gonadism, thyroidism, severe GHD, and DI. But he had no visual impairment. Uh, all days, uh, he has no indication. But I recommend him to improve the pituitary dysfunctions. And we did uh, such operation and uh, normal gland preserved. And six months later, uh, his pituitary dysfunctions were all improved in uh, normal range. 
I think it's a champion case, but the uh, other case uh, with uh, actually this function, I recommend them uh, to improve or to keep the appreciated functions. We can do uh, if we use the HDMI scope. Uh, so next is a lot of press shift uh, in case and uh, mild visual disturbance and uh, appreciated dysfunctions. Uh, this case, uh, just content of blood press test removed. And this case, like a pass, but this is not the uh, access blood press saved. After removal of the cyst content, uh, endoscope inserted into the cavity, cyst cavity, and negated using the sign. This case, more than one liter, uh, nearly a two liter negated and remove the cyst content and uh, irrigate it for the uh, reduce the information change. Such a case, uh, it is function because of the information change. So irrigation is uh, good for the uh, change of the character of the membrane. And uh, remove the membrane original for the pathological finding, just a reading. And this case sutures the membrane to the dura. Uh, to prevent the reaccumulation of the cyst content. And after the surgery, uh, cyst was shrinked and the visual disturbance improved and pituitary dysfunctions improved and no recovery. Our uh, next case is a rocconoid cyst. Uh, rocconoid cyst is, I think, uh, very difficult. Uh, Tumor. And in this case, uh, at the previous uh, former hospital, two times open surgery and recurred again and again and consulted with us. Open the serophor and here of the CSF and open the uh, arachnoid membrane, uh, tear off and removed. And the arachnoid cyst, we need the uh, multiple fenestrations. So the we need to make a uh, flow of the cyst rig, a CSF. So only one uh, hole is not enough. So this is a 70 degrees, and this is a uh, bilateral A2, and open the arachnoid membrane like this. And this is a final view. Cyst shrinked, and uh, more than six or seven years, no recurrence. Uh, next is the craniopharyngioma. Uh, craniopharyngioma, I think, uh, uh, most drastic change in TSS after HDN scope introductions. Uh, because uh, uh, craniopharyngioma is originated from uh, stroke here, so we have to reach and see directly to the stroke. Of course, open surgery can remove the tumor uh, totally, that the uh, uh, stroke was a blind, become blind. So TSS is ideal. Uh, approach to the cranial pharyngeal omer. Here is the optic nerve, and uh, now we can see the uh, superior hypophyseal artery, and this is a malleable suction, and uh, dissect the tumor from a uh, hypotronic region, and we can see the cleavage directory. Uh, see the cleavage and dissect the tumor and remove it. Here we can see the stroke. Here we can see the stroke and the cut distal point. And this is a final view. Totally removed. The next case, uh, craniopharyngioma, 44 years old woman, the tumor uh, located in the third ventricle. Uh, optic nerve is here. He has a chiasm is here. Maybe 10 years ago, I choose the open surgery in the hemsic approach. But I told that craniopharyngioma uh, direct approach to the stroke is very important. So TSS is ideal. So I drew out the cribus and the normal gland pull down to the caudal size and make a space here. At first drew out the uh, bottom of the cellar floor and cribus. And here is the uh, venous plexus. So much breathing, 
So I use the fossil and so on. This is a normal ground pull down here, and uh, uh, chiasm is here, stock is up here. So uh, gap between these uh, three structures, uh, tumor was removed piece by piece, and also uh, uh, dissect from the surrounding structures, uh, mainly in this case, uh, uh, hypothermic regions. And uh, such a uh, narrow coil, we have to use the counter technique like this. Uh, we must not do the uh, prudent surgery using uh, uh, such a uh, variable forceps in the tumor. And uh, from the mongo and the conduct, I observed. This is the final view. Stock was preserved. This is a chiasm normal gland. Uh, to, tumor was totally removed and no deficit after the surgery. Our next case is a 13 years old boy, uh, chronifying geoma. Uh, mainly a cystic, but the uh, intra tumor, there is a uh, calcified regions. Uh, we won't uh, choose GSS, but the uh, uh, problem of this case is tumor compressed the uh, uh, brainstem like this. And also here, 3D uh, CT tumor attached or involved the PCA and uh, maybe a half rate from the PCA. Uh, TSS most difficult uh, problem is preserve the perforators. So if we remove the tumor totally, but the, some uh, uh, injury of the perforator is uh, it caused a very serious complication after the surgery. So uh, to preserve PCA and the perforator, we choose the assisted approach from the lateral ventricle. Uh, in Japan, we can use the uh, flexible uh, endoscope. Uh, so uh, I asked the colleague and uh, look from the uh, lateral ventricle until the home. Uh, this is an endoscope from the uh, lateral ventricle. This is a farming model. And back to the TSS, uh, cyst was punctured and volume of the cyst getting down. And now from the lateral ventricle, a procedure from the lateral ventricle is very restricted, but uh, uh, he can dissect the tumor from the south ventricle. And after that, tumor removed piece by piece from TSS. And the uh, tumor uh, was detached from the lateral ventricle, so it's very easy to remove the tumor from TSS. And here's the hypothalamus. Uh, we use the scissors to uh, dissect from the uh, hypothalamus. And uh, some region attached to the south ventricle, so the sometimes use a counter technique. This is a uh, endoscopic view from the lateral ventricle. Uh, here, perforators here. So perforators confirmed from TSS and the lateral ventricle. So uh, uh, I didn't try to remove the tumor attached involving the uh, PCS perforators. And this is a, a closer procedure, sutured and uh, seropharotic constructions. In this case, we need a, a radiation after the surgery, so I used uh, nociceptral props. After the operation, uh, here is the original tumor. So uh, after the surgery, we did a cyber knife. Next case is a 33 years old woman. Uh, this is sagittal view. Stock is here and uh, solid uh, cranial fine with uh, uh, partial cystic region. Uh, maybe everybody think we can deal with the tumor only via TSS. But this coronal view, look at here, uh, lateral extension. And maybe this is an ICA. And uh, this region, there is a so many perforators from the ICA. Of course, we can remove the tumor only TSS. But to preserve the perforator is very difficult. And there is a possibility to injure the perforators. So combined surgery. Uh, from uh, right from the temporal approach, as a team look 
from the Serbian fishers. Uh, but first, remove the tumor piece by piece from TSS. And here is the uh, forceps from the uh, Serbian fishers. And uh, now I remove the tumor through the surgery. But uh, uh, other team look from a Serbian fisher, or you can do that, it's safe or it's dangerous. They, uh, they advise me. This is from Serbian fishers. The perforator is so many here and they detached the tumor from these perforators. And after that, uh, you can feel ease tumor uh, dissections. And now here, tumor getting down to the uh, cell floor, you can see. And sometimes uh, there is a uh, attach to the surrounding structures uh, from open surgeries uh, view, they are uh, dissected. And the posterior part is most severe adhesion. So, but uh, from open surgery, uh, they detached. So we can remove the tumor as an end block like this. And here is a far lateral side. Uh, this is ICA. This region from TSS, uh, we need a more wide uh, open here, but open surgery is easy. In uh, this case, uh, complete removal. So we use the spermicidism called uh, flux. Tumor was completely removed. I think uh, uh, innovation of uh, transfer surgery it's most effective in uh, cranial pharyngioma operations. Uh, on my uh, 109 case of the cranial pharyngioma, uh, before HD endoscope introduction, uh, introduction uh, almost 20 per removal rate was 0%. But after HD endoscope, uh, it increased to the 73%. And the total neural rate also improved to the more than 60%. And just rigish, 0%, no complications. But uh, uh, these 10 years uh, divided to the uh, first half and the other half, recently uh, 91% was TSS. So if we see the uh, cranial pharyngioma, we must think first. Uh, we can do TSS or not. And if we think some uh, dangerous things in the tumor, uh, we choose the combined surgeries. So I show the uh, surgical innovation of TSS in instrument, in technique, and complication avoidance. After that, surgical strategy for the pituitary tumors were changed. And also, surgical medication was expanded, expanded uh, comparing the 15 years ago and 20 years ago. Uh, last year, uh, we introduced the 4K ICC endoscope. I think it's promising to uh, understanding green fluorescence. Uh, maybe uh, it's common in the microscope, but the endoscope also equipped these functions. I think. Uh, it can detect the tumor. Uh, we can make a cleavage like this. And also, uh, microvascular uh, the, the tumor is also we can detect, but uh, uh, tumor detection, we can use it. So I think it's changed uh, more the TSS. Uh, conclusion, uh, our surgical innovation in endoscopic manipulations contribute to uh, preservation of functions, uh, such as uh, uh, pituitary functions and marginal safety is meant uh, to prevent uh, complications and its change and expand of uh, surgical indications uh, in current endoscopic TSS for pituitary tumors. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Kosaku uh, Amano, it was an indeed an excellent lecture. Uh, without uh, today, I would request the chair for today's session, Professor Abhidasha, for example, about Professor Kosaku Amano's presentation. Professor Abhidasha. Uh, yes, thank you, Sachin. Uh, Professor Amano, that was a fantastic lecture and a fantastic demonstration of surgical skill.
and uh, you have shown that most of these tumors you have you are tackling endoscopic transpenoidally. I have one question for you. Uh, do you have any indication for transcranial surgery now for any of these cases? Just pure transcranial. Um, my case is uh, fifteen percent is a transcranial surgery. Okay. So uh, I think this is my uh, you know merit, merit or advantage. Uh, most of Japanese transcranial neurosurgeon only do the transcranial. So <laughs> I think uh, open surgery is good, but they do the transcranial. But I do both. So I think it's good. So for a cranial pharyngioma, when you will go transcranial? What uh, is very, very calcified. So calcified. Man. And okay. uh, involve the arteries, uh, ACOM and ICA. Uh, that case, uh, we choose the uh, transcranial, but very rare, very rare. Okay. Yeah, after after cranial, if you once you think you have done total resection of cranial pharyngioma, do you just observe the patient or you give radiation? Uh, that's a very good question, because recently, uh, especially for the children, uh, now I try to uh, do the cyber knife, even they removed totally removed, because yeah. uh, we want to do the GH gross hormone replacement. And I think if we uh, think accomplished the total tumor resection, I think uh, cell level, there is a very small tumor was uh, still around the arachnoid membrane. So I think uh, after the total resection of the tumor, I think we need a cyber knife. But uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, we need a problem of the ethics. So I cannot say so widely, but uh, I think uh, true total tumor resection is, uh, I think, difficult in cranial pharyngioma. But, uh, uh, you know, in MRI, it looks totally removed. But uh, some, and also some case, uh, there is regional tumor, but not really gross. So such case, uh, we uh, misunderstand the total removal that no recurrence. I think that's a very uh, difficult problem. Yes, yes, I agree. So basically, sometimes even if you feel there is total removal, then you still get recurrence after a few years. And then you think you've removed it completely, but still the tumor has come back. So what we generally do is wait one more time. Suppose I've done total removal, I'll wait till it recurs, then operate again and then give radiation, something like that, you know, give it some chance for one time and then maybe give radiation. Mm. So that is what we try to do. So if I think I can involve the discussants now for some of their questions. Professor Sarik. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine. You can uh, have hello. any questions. Professor yeah. Yokakata, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this case with Professor Kasoku Amono. Yes. Thank you so much. A very excellent lecture because it's very uh, demanding to remove the cranial pharyngioma microsurgically or uh, endonasal endoscopic technique. Because uh, removing uh, around the pituitary stock uh, microsurgically, also endoscopically, is very demanding. So, my question is what is your techniques to remove uh, the tumor attaching to the pituitary stock? Uh, well, hypothalamic structures. So before I converted to the transferred surgery completely, I use the endoscope even in the open surgery. So cardiac side of the chiasma stroke region, uh, we cannot see uh, from the interhemsic approach, but uh, if you use the endoscope, even in the open surgery, uh, 70 degrees, 45 degrees endoscope, you can see the uh, stroke and the cardiac side of chiasma. But that was so difficult. So, uh, because I have not any experience with the endoscope, but we usually remove uh, microsurgically, but we found that sometimes it is very attached to the pitu pituitary stock and the perforators mm -hmm. around the pituitary stock. So that sometimes we make uh, some residue uh, left some tumor left behind. So your recommendation is 
uh, radiation therapy for residual tumors? But I think uh, regional tumor uh, attached to the hypothalamus and the optic nerve is uh, it's okay. But I think craniopharyngeal is originated from a stroke. So if we remove the tumor attached to the stroke, uh, possibility of regrowth getting I think. So the, uh, of course, uh, diabetes in spades, it's a big problem, but uh, to think about the uh, recurrence of craniopharyngioma to remove aggressively to the stroke is very important. But the uh, hypothalamus, optic nerve, it's okay to give up. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, Sensei, thank you very much for your great lecture. Just I want to know the the some uh, the surface, the the tumor attached to the, the hypo uh, or the invade of the hypothalamus is easier to demarcate, or can you dissect from the hypothalamus? Yes. I, I think it's very important. And yeah, technically it's easy. And ten years ago, uh, I removed the invade to the uh, hypothalamus thermic both side uh, every cases but after the operation uh, cognitive functions and uh, obesity and uh, uh, loss of short memory is big problem so recently uh, look at the corner view of MRI and invaded uh, cleavage between the tumor and the hypothalamus uh, not clear side I preserve uh, two months ago I created the uh, craniopharyngioma, he was a teacher. Uh, so cognitive function is big problem for him. So I preserved left side of uh, tumor attached to the hypothalamus I preserved. So I changed the uh, strategy of surgery, changed case by case. Maybe the you changed, you used to now is a 4K uh, endoscope. Yes. Is there any uh, chance to remove the, the more uh, uh, volume of the tumor with the 4K? No, <laughs> not different. A little bit improved, okay. but I think that that's promising. Uh, we uh, try to the uh, what function it has. It has been a, a ICZ endoscope. So uh, another problem in uh, craniofungium operation is how to preserve the uh, perforators, uh, especially the super or hypothesal artery. And uh, uh, we often uh, consider this perforator is a passing artery or to the optic nerve, or to the, the tumor. This is, it is very difficult to determine passing artery or not. At that time, uh, ICZ endoscope was very useful. So uh, this artery is to the optic nerve, so we have to preserve. This artery go to tumor directory. We cut off. Uh, we can use uh, ICZ endoscope such a uh, situations. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Sachin? Yeah. Uh, thank, you. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, Abita. Yeah, Professor Wozniak, you have something. Yes, uh, Professor Amano, thank you very much for your great lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you are very experienced and. and uh, I really mm, support your philosophy of uh, not harming the surgery. I started my transphenoidal many, many years ago since when we even didn't have no microscope with the loop and the CR. It was a, my first experience with that micro than endo, uh, but I still uh, still mostly do most of my cases with, with the micro, with the endoscopic assistance. Um, and I want to thank you for that you insist that we must preserve the pituitary stock. It's very important because you remember our teachers taught us that we always must cut, otherwise our surgery is not uh, radical. Mm -hmm. So I always try to preserve. Even I cannot preserve anatomically, I preserve all the small vessels uh, around in the pyom meter and uh, in many cases it's enough to avoid the diabetes insipidus in patient uh, post-surgery. Uh, so thank you for this. 
I have some qu a few questions. First of all, first of qu question concerning pseudocapsule, the tumor. Do you recognize it always in all surgeries or just not in all the case? Because in my practice, I, I do not see it every time. Yes, I'm happy when I have it. I, I'm really happy, but sometimes, unfortunately, I, I do not, I cannot recognize it. That's the first question. And another one uh, about uh, uh, non-functional pituitary adenomas. In patient without uh, visual uh, impairment, but uh, with a significant uh, hyperpituitary. What do you think? Either propose surgery or just to give a replacement therapy and wait and observe. What is your strategy in your practice? Thank I'll you. Pass, Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, first question, uh, should the capsule, uh, not every case, but if I cannot find, I try to find, uh, crack the surface of the uh, normal gland and uh, if I cannot find, uh, that stop. But if I can peel off the uh, small membrane, I try to remove. And the second case, I uh, I think a uh, uh, function becomes the indication for the non-function at the normal. So, uh, but different from the age and uh, uh, male or female. And uh, so all the patient more than 70 years old, I don't recommend the pituitary dysfunction as uh, indication of TSS. But uh, young patient, I recommend them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander. I can see some hand raised. Uh, yes, Dr. Artikul Islam, kindly please introduce yourself and ask the question. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Atikul. We can't hear you. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, your brilliant presentation, Professor uh, Amano. I am Dr. K. Matikul Islam, young neurosurgeon from Bangladesh. I work in National Institute of Neuroscience, Dhaka. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first question, sometimes we uh, find some patients of growth hormone secreting pituitary macro adenoma we say uh, extensive cavernous sinus involvement. And uh, sometimes it is very difficult to uh, remove all the tumor. And uh, post-op hormone assessment shows that the hormone is not controlled totally. What should we do uh, in those cases? My second case is, case is, uh, my second question is, uh, we have some uh, patients of uh, MRI negative pushing disease, hormone, Hormonal features suggest that uh, he or she has all features of Cushing disease, but MRI is negative. Uh, in that case, uh, we do IPSS and uh, try to find out the tumor. Do we have any suggestion uh, regarding this type of uh, patients? And my third question is, uh, do you put a lumbar drain prophylactically to uh, prevent CSF leak? And my final question is, uh, sometimes in giant uh, cell or supracellular tumor, a uh, system sometimes uh, come down earlier and uh, it obscured the supracellular part. What's your technique uh, to remove those uh, part of supracellular tumor? Thank you very much. I think you don't hesitate the combined surgery. Uh, very, very huge when not only TSS, but the combined surgery with uh, open surgery is, I think, uh, a uh, good way to remove such a, a huge adenoma. But uh, since this is the uh, most difficult, so uh, we need the uh, uh, help of the radiation and uh, uh, medical treatment. Yeah. Thank you. And so, but, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, but uh, these series I didn't uh, demonstrate the uh, functioning adeno adenoma uh, combined uh, surgery, but uh, we, uh, do also do combined surgery for the uh, function that they know that's huge one. Sir, uh, do you put a lumbar drain prophylactically to prevent pre CSF leak? Uh, I never use uh, lumbar drain okay. because, <laughs> because I got a very, very uh, severe experience two times. Uh, yeah, so uh, don't rely on the uh, lumbar drainers. Then, sir, uh, thank you, sir. What is your protocol of uh, finding out the tumor in MRI negative pushing disease? 
am I negative? Uh, please ask the endocrinologist. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> there are some uh, regional tumor in the anywhere or uh, not causing other ectopic regions. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Atikul. Uh, yes, Dr. Joe Ye Sun, uh, please kindly unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask the question. Dr. Joe? Hi, uh, good evening, uh, Prof. Kato, Prof. Uh, Prof. Kato Amano, and uh, uh, Dr. Sachin, uh, Dr. Adipa. I'm Sam, uh, neurosurgeon from Malaysia. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. I, I would like to ask regarding giant pituitary macroadenomas. I uh, recently had a few experiences. Uh, what uh, is your preference, either transcranial or transphenoidal for tumors extending to third ventricle and all the way to the uh, prepontine system? Uh, or if we do a combined approach, would you do the transcranial first or a transphenoidal first? Because I think we have had few instances in which uh, pituitary apoplexy occurs uh, when uh, either when we do the transphenoidal or the transcranial first, and actually uh, that's uh, with a bad outcome because of the apoplexy. What, what is your opinion on that? Thanks. So the part of the combined surgery for the adenoma is to prevent the apoplexy after the surgery. So regional tumor that makes the apoplexy after, uh, after the surgery. So which first is difficult? But recently we do the uh, simultaneously. And uh, which is first, I think it's not a problem to simultaneously. And, uh, but uh, you know, uh, mainly removed from the TSS. So the open surgery, uh, from open surgery, they push, they uh, sector of surrounding surgery and push into the cell floor. But of course, far lateral side, uh, expanding to the cerebral fissure, of course, that region removed from the uh, cerebral fissure, but mostly the uh, open surgery from open surgery is uh, observed and push to the cell. That is the main work from the open surgery. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jo. Uh, Dr. Ikech Ku Anyakut, please unmute yourself and ask about Dr. Ikech Ku. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sachin. Uh, Thank you, Professor Yuko Katsu, for all you do. And thank you, my teacher, Professor Abidasha. Dennis, thank how you, are Professor. You? I'm fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Manu, for this wonderful presentation on the innovations of transphenoidal surgery. I found interesting the suturing of the dura. Very difficult. To do, but you can do it with your innovation. I probably found uh, interesting some of the instruments you use, like the the knot tighter, and uh, some of the bent instruments. Yeah, so my question is: You prefer transphenoidal mucosal flap to the pedicle nasoceptor flap? So please, uh, what's the high point of this sphenoid, sphen, uh, sphen, uh, sphenoid, sphenoid, sphenoid sinus, sinus mucosal flap over the pedicle flap? I know this sphenoid sinus mucosal flap has a theoretical risk of a mucosal. I don't mm -hmm. know how, I don't know how, um, how it has been in your practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sir. A wonderful position indeed. So turning uh, in TSS is, is you need the uh, practice. So try, try hard. And of course, at first it takes one hour, two hours, but uh, you trained within the five minutes, you can do that. So train, train, train. And uh, uh, tighten the knot, uh, you can use uh, uh, 19 degrees uh, ring to it. You can use that for the uh, knot tighter. And the third question is, uh, uh, sinus mucosa flap. Yeah, 
Uh, I think that's it. Just to recover to the original state. So when science mucosal the flap, it looks at something new method, but just recover to the original state. And uh, please read that my uh, paper and the reviewer said, same as you, it is a possibility of making a mucosary, but that was the old doctor's uh, misunderstanding. I have never experienced that because that spinal science mucosa was still, uh, you know, alive. There's much faster. So the, uh, I have never experienced a mucosary. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Sketchipu. <clears throat> so I, I don't have a question, but I just want to mention that I had an opportunity to assist uh, a transpinoid in surgery with Professor Kosaku Amano when he had come to Apollo Hospital, Chennai, India, around maybe around five years ago. And uh, when uh, when one month ago, I was in Japan for fellowship under Professor Yokosato, and I had gone to Tokyo Women's Hospital. He saw me and he recognized me just in one second. I have become a little fat, but still he recognized me. So thank you very much, Professor. And another thing I wanted to say is, uh, Professor Kosaku Amano had some special instrument to suture the dura uh, through transpinoidal uh, surgery. So if anybody uh, interested to learn his technique, you can go to his place for some time and learn those techniques. Very interesting and very beautiful techniques. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, anybody has any doubt or any uh, comment to make, panelists or delegates? Yes, Dr. Chen from China. Dr. Chen, please unmute yourself and ask. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Amano. Uh, I'm very enjoying your uh, presentation. And uh, uh, my question is about uh, as a young neurosurgery. In Japan, do we have a, a lab for training? Uh, and the practical for the young neurosurgeon uh, for the uh, endoscope, because it's very difficult uh, the the dips and uh, the uh, widen uh, vision different uh, with the uh, open cranial. Uh, so, do we have such lab uh, training a uh, course or lab? Yes, uh, we have uh, you know uh, some training course, and uh, maybe four times or five times in a year, but we use, uh, you know, caliber is uh, ideal, but uh, we use the artificial uh, skull base model oh, and we use for the beginners. And uh, uh, that's a uh, training course is just, uh, you know, accustomed to the, how to use the endoscope and how to use the uh, uh, dedicated instrument for the TSS. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we want to know, uh, we want to them to know that how difficult endoscopic procedures, how different from the microscope procedures. So after that, I recommend them, please look at the operation of expert. Mm -hmm. And after that, they go back to their, uh, each institution and try. So I think uh, some uh, training courses uh, you need. And uh, mm -hmm. I several times I have uh, been to the uh, China and I helped them. But the uh, caliber course is uh, ideal, yeah. But the uh, recently program is, uh, you know, company, uh, Souls and Olympus, uh, they hate it to lend us the uh, endoscope and the instrument for the caliber. So that is a big problem. Yeah, so uh, if, if some uh, company can build a um, uh, training lab for young neurosurgery, uh, specific for the uh, suture and the uh, endoscope, it's very uh, difficult to practice in home or in, in, in patient. Uh, so I recommend that if someday, someday uh, some uh, company can help us. Okay. Thank you so much. Hmm? Dr. Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ben. Yes, hello, hello, Professor Manu. I'm uh, uh, Ben from Hong Kong, and I uh, thank you so much for your talk. And uh, I also do uh, endoscopic transfusional search. And uh, yesterday we have a case, or or this morning we have a case of a giant pituitary prolactinoma. 
that uh, expand into the whole, nearly the whole front range that uh, they have some post up building ready to go in. They ask, uh, what's your experience for those giant pituitary microadenoma for the transhumanal search? And uh, do you have some special, um, if you have, if you lift the tumor uh, with, with intention, do you have some intraoperative gadgets to let you know whether you have uh, how, how much residual tumor left or any uh, beating inside? For example, ultrasound, do you use it? And also, I agree, Professor, that uh, we to have a training, daily training for the scalpel surgeon, especially when you're considering the suture technique. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Professor. Uh, well, Dr. Ben, can you repeat your question specifically? What is the question? Yes, my question is up. Uh, yeah, my question okay. is uh, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Please off the mask. Sorry, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, so no, my question okay. is about the uh, try. Yeah, giant pituitary microadenoma. Yes, we have a case uh, with a very big pituitary adenoma that uh, expanded into the whole third branch. And uh, the problem is that uh, the, uh, we intentionally, we want to lift some tumor behind, but the residual tumor uh, uh, has a chance of a repeating. So may I ask uh, Professor Amano, uh, is there any experience for you uh, for those uh, giant pituitary uh, adenoma, that uh, if you want to leave some behind, do you have some uh, intraoperative um, uh, device, for example, ultrasound to guide you, or what is your what is your uh, advice for those giant pituitary cases? Giant pituitary adenoma is, I think, most of the case. Uh, more difficult than uh, cranial pharyngioma. And that uh, strategy is different from case by case. And it's different also from the you non know, and uh, So if you show me the MRI or history of the patient, I cannot say the in detail. That, that's different from case by case. Yeah, but uh, you must run uh, strategy, uh, combined surgery, you must think about uh, if you with such a giant as enormous. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben and uh, Professor Prashad Kormand. Uh, anybody has any comments or any questions? Uh, if not, uh, then I would request Professor Prashad Kormand to please be with us because uh, uh, we'll go ahead with our uh, the next speaker, that is the young neurosurgeon speaker for uh, today's session. I will request your uh, presentation also. So let's move ahead. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Khalil Al Fadasi. Uh, he is a member of WFNS Young Neurosurgeon Award Committee. He is also board member of Arab Neurosurgical Society, WFNS delegate at Yemen Neurosurgery Society. And currently, he is a skull based cerebrovascular fellow at the Department of Neurosurgery, University of Montreal at Canada. So, I would request uh, Dr. Khalil to start the presentation. Uh, Dr. Khalil? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sashan, for uh, the nice presentation. And uh, of course, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kato for uh, um, uh, you know her kind of invitation and uh, Professor Amano uh, for his uh, interesting uh, presentation and also everybody in the board. Um, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, uh, proceed with the presentation for the sake of the time. Um, my presentation, I don't know if I can share screen. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Uh, 
Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead now. Uh, okay, uh, the uh, second presentation for today, it's about interhemispheric approach, the fundamental principle we'll try in this presentation to, uh, you know, uh, summarize this kind of approach that I think most of the neurosurgeons are familiar with this uh, approach. The, uh, the uh, you know, the target of this uh, lecture is, and presentation is to summarize and to go step by step uh, uh, through this approach to review each, uh, uh, you know, uh, steps, uh, anatomical things. And then uh, we had some cases that we, we've been done over the last uh, two or three months, like case uh, illustrations. So uh, interhemispheric approach, uh, this is, uh, by the way, our center here in uh, Shum Hospital, uh, Montreal. It's one of the mega hospital in Canada and one of the biggest hospital in North America. I uh, would like to welcome uh, a junior uh, neurosurgeon to join us for, uh, you know, um, like uh, observer fellowships, uh, almost welcome. I have no disclosures uh, in this presentation. Uh, this is one case that, uh, you know, interhemispheric approach usually is the ideal uh, approach to uh, reach like for uh, uh, colloid cyst if the endoscopic, uh, I mean, approach uh, does not give us like uh, the optimal uh, uh, result. Uh, we will go through this case uh, later in our presentation. So the interhemispheric approach is a natural route to reach the powerful sign and preventricular uh, structures through the interhemispheric fissure. Uh, in this presentation, uh, sorry, uh, we report like main anterior and posterior corridors to the interhemispheric approach. Uh, we're going back like in the history of the interhemispheric approach, uh, um, uh, Walter Dandy, he was the first in 1915 to, uh, you know, uh, describe the posterior interhemispheric transclosal approach to the pineal region. Uh, uh, German neurosurgeon, uh, Professor Tony, uh, he was also uh, uh, describes the anterior interhemispheric approach to access the ruptured ACOB aneurysm. And also uh, Professor William Wagon, he was uh, describing the, the, this approach for um, some interhemispheric uh, masses like AVMs, lesions, then the lateral third ventricle. Uh, uh, like mostly this approach is directed to the um, lesions in the third ventricle. So this is like schematic representation of how it goes through the, you know, from uh, like 335 years before century, I mean, uh, until uh, now and how it goes, uh, you know, historically and how it uh, developed. This schematic representation is highlighted some common tumors in the third ventricle, as we can see here uh, in the foramen of Monroe. This is like a most common locations of the lesions in the third ventricle, uh, foramen of Monroe, anterior third ventricle, and posterior third ventricle. Okay, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will go like step by step. So, uh, the first is how those patients are going to approach uh, the neurosurgeon or the doctor or the medical facility. So clinically, those patients usually uh, has to come either with obstructive symptoms or a compression symptoms. Uh, uh, it might be like sometimes asymptomatic and, uh, you know, the tumor going to be detected is just uh, for workup uh, for unrelated headaches acute obstructive uh, symptoms, as everybody knows, usually manifested by headaches, nausea, and vomiting. And large masses can uh, lead to sometimes to uh, poor balance, uh, cognitive dysfunction, personality changes, motor weaknesses, taxi and visual disturbance, and seizures in some cases. Uh, patients sometimes, and this is an important, you know, uh, uh, sentence, or, or, or we, we should we should not ignore that that some patients they are unaware of their memory difficulties, and should be undergo like if you're gonna go for surgery, you should go as a preoperative workup to do a neurophysiological uh, uh, testing to assess because uh, as we're gonna see. Uh, one of the most uh, you know, common complications is 
uh, memory difficulties or memory deficits post-op. So, so you have to assess your patient before and after to compare uh, I mean, uh, the outcome. Obstructive uh, hydrocephalus sometimes, um, as we mentioned, acute chronic or intermittent symptoms, and it might unfortunately, in some cases, lead to sudden death. Um, uh, those patients, we mentioned already the, the, the symptoms. It, we had another presentation, which is the compression symptoms. So uh, one of the most common uh, compressive symptoms is the midbrain uh, paranoid syndrome. And this is usually uh, the compression of the rostral interstitial nuclei. And it will lead, uh, I mean, uh, to some interesting uh, symptoms, which is the vertical gaze palsy and cognitive, uh, I mean, conversion retraction nystagmus uh, uh, and bilateral lid retraction with light near dissociation. Uh, many fourth ventricle also like uh, um, uh, has uh, compression symptoms and such ataxia, so don't like uh, confuse between uh, those uh, symptoms, I mean, syndromes. So that was like a very quick review of the um, clinical presentations. Okay, now we have a patient with such symptoms. What will be the next step or what will be the next stage, which is the evaluation and diagnosis. And uh, as everybody knows, the first modality or the gold standard is the MRI, which is gonna give us like a, a, a detailed uh, information about the size, vascularity and extent of the envision. Also, uh, it permits evaluation of the pure pre-tumoral environment like associated edema, ventricular anatomy, and also uh, uh, for preoperative pre uh, planning as well. Understanding 3D anatomy of the deep lesions is important for selection of appropriate corridor to minimize brain retraction. So those are the main principles I mean, when you look for a preoperative evaluation of such cases. Uh, uh, special attention is required to study the ventricular veins. And this is an, a gold standard. We should then, the, the neurosurgeon should review that many times before going like for uh, such approach. And uh, uh, the functionality uh, of the overlying cortices is also an important uh, part before, I mean, before surgery. Uh, as well also the vascularity of the tumor increased the risk of operation uh, because of the deep narrow surgical corridor. Well, the lesions that uh, uh, usually um, a neurosurgeon are familiar with in the third ventricle, like colitis, cellular masses, sarcoidosis, aneurysm, easily accessible by this route. As everybody knows, we have an interhemispheric approaches uh, um, the most one familiar is the anterior, anterior interhemispheric uh, transcloser approach, the dandy uh, approach, which is the posterior uh, uh, approach. Uh, in some uh, literatures, they are describing the uh, ipsilateral and contralateral uh, uh, interhemispheric approach. Well, uh, this is the, the corridors to the, the, the lateral and uh, third ventricular uh, systems, I mean, posteriorly to anterior approaches. Uh, uh, and uh, it depends on the what lesion uh, you're gonna uh, approach and uh, the surrounding anatomy. Okay, that was like a quick uh, review about the presentations and the preoperative uh, evaluation. Now we're gonna go like uh, in both anterior and interhemispheric approach in detail. I mean, step by step, we're gonna review the anatomy of uh, our corridors. And after that, the preoperative planning, surgical approach. And we ended up with uh, some illustrative videos for uh, some of our cases. So with that, uh, I think uh, the, the, the approach will be uh, easy and uh, clear for uh, everybody. I mean, to review this approach. So uh, general con consideration of the anterior interhemispheric approach, anterior posterior uh, and posterior interhemispheric approach provided an access to the deep midline, powerful sign and paraventricular spaces. Uh, usually the craniotomy is around the coronal suture to protect the, the sino, um, uh, sensor mature cortices 
and usually it's three to four centimeter posterior to the coronal suture. Uh, uh, sacrifice of the uh, large para sagittal bridging veins may lead to a venous infarction and hemiparesis, which is a uh, major sequelae post-op, so try to avoid doing that. Uh, fixed retraction must be avoided through the use, I mean, trying to use dynamic or gravity induced retraction. And some neurosurgeons, they prefer to do a CSF drainage like uh, lumbar drainage or ventriculostomy uh, in such, in some, uh, you know, individual cases to mobilize the hemisphere away from the midline. Uh, cerebrovascular structure in each dissection level should be carefully preserved and uh, uh, we mentioned already the, the sagittal sinus and the venous tributaries. So anterior uh, transcolossal uh, approach, what is the advantages? It's short trajectory to the third ventricle. It can access posterior and uh, basal uh, veins, but, uh, you know, uh, third ventricle, bilateral exposure of the foramen of Monroe and Roman requirement of uh, ventriculomegaly. And as well, the complications um, for initial injury, a recent memory disturbance, uh, vascular compromise like basal ganglial infarct, thalamic infarct, which will be limbic ischemia, and hippocampal syndrome. Now, the anatomical rabbit review. So, from up to down, this is the incision and uh, the craniotomy. And we can see here our structures. So major topographical elements of the midline corridor, superior and inferior sagittal sinuses. And then we're going to go to the parasagittal veins. We should review that also pre-op. Gyrus, the cingulum. And then the corpus callosum, uh, pre-callosal arteries, and the furnaces down. There we are, and then septembolicidum, uh, cisterna villi interbositum, and then lateral and third ventricle. We, we have a good pictures later, we, we will see it. This is a pictures from Rotten. Uh, we can see here uh, the superior sagittal sinus, here the coronal suture. We mentioned that uh, how to draw it like three uh, to four centimeter and two third anterior, one third posteriorly. Here the uh, lateral view and the you know the the vein bridging vein around. We uh, usually going to the falls, and uh, we mentioned the uh, the third ventricle. And uh, I don't know, it's a little bit a busy uh, image, but uh, we have a next uh, images will be uh, I mean more clear to everybody. Okay, this is the first one. We have, as you go in this uh, approach, you have specific landmarks. So as you go, you should divide your, uh, you know, corridor or route into a stages or the steps so you will be more oriented. So the first landmark is the, the same line, which is here. So, and then the corpus callosum. So as you pass the, the very closal arteries and you reach to the corpus callosum, you are already at the uh, landmark number two. And then the furnaces, which is an important structure, try avoid touching that or uh, injuring the, the furnaces uh, because of the devastating, uh, um, you know, memory deficits most probably is the most, uh, you know, complication bust up. Uh, cerebrovascular structure at each dissection level should be carefully preserved. So uh, anatomy, anatomy, and anatomy. Uh, this is in general in neurosurgery and in each approach. You should review it uh, even before uh, before surgery, especially for the, for the young neurosurgeons, uh, you know, senior residents, fellows, uh, before going to any um, approaches. Diencephalic veins are of a special importance to avoid surgical morbidity. Uh, uh, this lecture, I mean, this uh, slide is going to show you how, a, I mean, which uh, structures you're going to see in the ipsilateral and midline uh, uh, through your approach. Like, for example, the midline, the posterior sagittal, the superior sagittal sinus, you can reach to the A3, A4 segments, anterior cerebral artery, anterior corpus callosum, 
valium terbazetum. So, you know, we have many pathology can be uh, in those uh, uh, structures, can be approached by interhemispheric approach. Preoperative consideration. MRI, we mentioned that. And you have to take, you know, extra precautions of uh, injuring the bridging wing and the sinuses for surgery of vascular lesion and aneurysm. A digit, digital angiography, the subtraction angiography is helpful. Neural navigation also, of course, is one of the uh, preoperative modalities that are gonna help you to uh, uh, allocate the lesion during the surgery and uh, to uh, identify the surrounding structures. In the vascular procedures uh, as well, uh, we, we need transcranial Doppler, especially for the aneurysm and AVMs. CSF drainage, and we mentioned that. So this are like, cooperative evaluations. Now we are in the operating theater with the patient. Uh, uh, the most important thing is the positioning because positioning pre-op is going to help you a lot in this approach uh, uh, to uh, like give you a good view uh, to, toward your lesion. So with careful positioning and head rotation, gravity-assisted self-retraction of the brain combined with the CSF drainage, it's widening the interhemistric fissure, allowing for atraumatic surgical dissection with a rigid brain retraction. Patient may be placed in a supine or lateral position. It depends on the lesion and uh, its size. Uh, the head and uh, operating table should be elevated at approximately 15 to uh, I mean degree and to provide sufficient uh, venous drainage. So uh, you flex the head, but try not to overflex the, the neck to avoid the venous uh, you know, uh, compression in the neck, and which lead to uh, increase the intracranial pressure. Uh, then, the, you know, after positioning the head but with the mouth, my field, uh, the, like whatever you like, supine, uh, lateral position, we go to the incision. So we have, you know, it's, it's, it's a surgeon preference, uh, but the most common um, uh, incisions is what we, you see here, the curvilinear or a linear incision. We have here the uh, coronal suture. So uh, two-third anterior and one-third posteriorly. Uh, the subcutaneous tissue is mobilized and the gallia aponeurosis and the periosteal layer are incised in a careful linear uh, fashion and refracted to the midline. We will see that in the next uh, image. Here, we have already uh, taken away the skin. Now, this is the craniotomy. Uh, I mean, side. Uh, here also, it's a, surgic, a surgeon to surgeon preference. So, so some of, of the neurosurgeons, they just use one uh, per hole, but uh, you know, the ideal one and uh, uh, the most saver is to do a per hole, like uh, one or two away from the midline. And then uh, what we do in, in, in our practice here, we do another over the like one, two, or sometimes three over the severus vegetal sinus. Uh, and then when you start your uh, drilling, you always uh, you start away from the, um, the, the, the sagittal sinus, of course. And then you, uh, you try to dissect the, the sinus away from your uh, so, and then you complete your uh, craniotomy. This is what we mentioned. Uh, uh, a dura is separated from the inner table of the calvarium over the sinuses and deep to uh, blind the cranium to make the painful uh, dissection. This is the illustrative image from uh, Rota, from uh, Aaron Cohen Atlas. Uh, 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 always we, we start outside the, the sinuses and then we connect. Uh, just to avoid doing that. So, um, I mean, to avoid injury of the sagittal sinus. We uh, prefer before, I mean, taking the pain, the, the pun away to uh, do a just a, like a very close adjacent per hole. So two per holes, sometimes, you know, uh, it's not enough. So we, we do the third one here 
and try to connect it, uh, you know, to dissect uh, under the, the pool. Uh, when it's safe and you feel that it's, I mean, uh, the whole um, incisions is connected, so then easily you can go with your saw and uh, take the bone away. Okay, then uh, the second stage, the dural opening, you would in this shape, like uh, in a careful inner shape. And here is our sinus. This is one of our cases that we, we suture uh, the dura and try to retract it away. So it give you a good uh, view in your field and also protecting your sinus. Sometimes uh, we, you use some telfa be, 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 be beneath the, uh, the, the dura before uh, retract it away. Bridging vein running within the dura or the fog supply before the entering the superior sagittal sinus should be dissected away from the dura. So when you retract the dura, it will not, I mean, uh, rupture those uh, small dural veins. Uh, if the bridging vein is injured or must be sacrificed, uh, cerebral attraction in this area should be minimized to prevent cerebral infarction and post-operative brain edema as well. Uh, the second stage, it's the, which is the absolutely interferometric fissure dissection and mobilization of the falx cerebri. Here, uh, so you have opened the dura, you put like some telfa at uh, one uh, side, and you, then you start uh, dissecting through the fox. Uh, you reach to the now to the part of, I mean, to the corpus callosum. Uh, the landmarks for that is, uh, as everybody knows, is the callosal marginal and pre callosal arteries. So uh, after opening the fall, uh, the corpus callosum. Uh, we are speaking now about the anterior uh, interhemispheric approach. Try to make like a small hole. You know, some um, neurosurgeons they prefer not more than two centimeter, and usually it's well, between one and two centimeters of callosotomy. Neuronavigation, of course, gonna help you uh, to guide planning and the trajectory at which uh, uh, direction you're gonna open your. Uh, uh, I mean uh, the hole in the colossal in the colo uh, in the corpus callosum. Uh, okay, you reach your lesion and you dissect it after reaching the goal of surgery. Subdural space and ventricles uh, should be uh, you know filled up with uh, artificial CSF, which is the, usually the saline, and dura should be closed in a watertight fashion. Uh, because we, we could see like some cases, uh, uh, especially if the lesion, so, you know, in the early post-operative days for a minute of Monroe will be a little bit blocked by some, you know, post-operative uh, residual plot or whatever. Uh, so you, you're going to see those patients going to come back to the emergency with the CSF, uh, you know, leaking from the wound. So try to close the dura in a water, uh, watertight fashion and uh, covering the superior sagittal sinus with the uh, gel foam and surgery cell should not be uh, also removed during the surgery. And also, uh, you know, it depends case to case uh, accessing the ventricular system sometimes. And this is what we usually do if you see the patient having some residual blood to put some ventricular catheter maybe sometimes requiring uh, for like one or two post-operative periods. Uh, this picture gonna show you that some variations of, uh, you know, uh, craniotomy and the trajectories of interhemispheric approach, the anterior one. So it depends, uh, sometimes it goes like away from the um, uh, coronal suture, sometimes like a midway, uh, and also the directions of uh, of your uh, trajectory. It's it depends case to case. Uh, before going to the video, this is like a quick review of what we mentioned. I mean anatomical landmarks. So number one is the false reply. So then we go to the callosal marginal artery as you go here. 
Pavic callosal arteries, here of course, is the corpus callosum. And third, lateral ventricles, we go number six, the third ventricle. So those are the most important structures in Norway. And septal veins, uh, furnaces, of course, is one of the most important structures in your corridor. This is one of our cases that we have done here with Professor Labidi, and I don't know if the video. Uh, yes. So uh, what we have mentioned, we're gonna review it in this video. So we put here the telfa after incident of the dura. This is interhemispheric dissection, careful dissection. You go identify your anatomy, the preclosal arteries, and here the, the white uh, structure, as you know, is the corpus callosum. With the callosotomy, we do a small little hole. Now you can see the CSF is starting to appear with the lateral ventricle. Or I mean of Monroe dissection. This is the case that we, uh, you know, uh, mentioned at the beginning of this presentation with the um, colloid cyst. So now we are approaching the colloid uh, resection of the colloid cyst, little hemorrhage. So, a general principle of any lesions like depulking, and then try to identify the walls of the cyst and dissecting it uh, stage, I mean, step by step from a uh, different direction. So, we mobilize the cyst. Try to accelerate the video a little bit. Of course, uh, uh, you should take care for like the for uh, furnaces not to be injured uh, because uh, you know the uh, we had one case uh, before like six or eight months uh, had little you know uh, injury to the furnace uh, with some little memory deficit post-op. So you're gonna keep those, those kind of patients sometimes in the hospital for more than like three, four weeks uh, until he able to manage and be able to, to go back to his usual life. So now we, we have removed the, the colloidal cyst. You do a septostomy, which is uh, increase the advantage of this surgery and we see the, the other ventricle. Uh, again, we bought some gel foam uh, with the TCL. Uh, that was uh, one case for uh, interhemispheric approach. This is the patient like pre-op and the MRI post-op. Another case with uh, uh, neurocytoma, uh, this is like a lady of 29 uh, years old with, with a big uh, lesion. Uh, we positioned this patient in a lateral position. And this is our, uh, you know, craniotomy. Dural incision has been done. Now we dissect uh, the, uh, you know, the veins and the sagittal sinus carefully try to preserve each single bridging vein. Now, in our way to approach the false, false is easily opened with a good positioning. You're gonna get a good, you know, access to uh, to this approach, and you don't need um, the fixed retractor. This is ongoing now. Um, false dissection. We can see here the cingulum and the preclosal artery, uh, the closal marginal arteries, and on the way reaching to the preclosal arteries, and underneath uh, the bared preclosal arteries, you will reach to the corpus callosum, the uh, body. Okay. 
careful dissection of uh, the even the small perforated small veins you, you, you could appreciate how is the field clean and clear until you reach to the second land, landmark which is the carbus callosum of course callosotomy uh, usually a small uh, hole in the carbus callosum till reaching the ventricle ventricular system which is uh, of course the lateral ventricle uh, uh, then, of course, uh, during the surgery, you're going to use the neuro navigation to identify your trajectory and uh, reaching the lesion, as we can see now. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, in, in some of our cases, we used like endoscopic assisted uh, uh, technique. So, as you progress in the legion dissection or depulking, uh, sometimes the neural navigation will not give you like uh, full information about your direction and how much did you dissect. So you use the endoscope during the surgery plus the, of course, the microscope to assess you, uh, you know, assessing the anatomy. And sometimes uh, this, like this patient, the, the legion is so huge and it goes laterally uh, so the endoscope will be uh, having a great value to help you in such cases this is like an intraoperative assisted uh, illustration of the neural navigation and uh, also we used like uh, time of flight uh, mri to uh, identify the uh, vascular structures Again, endoscope before uh, you know uh, the end of surgery gonna give you like a good information. This is like the pre-op, and this is the uh, the post-op picture with almost uh, total resection of the lesion. Uh, that was, uh, you know, a quick review about the anterior interhemispheric approach. The posterior interhemispheric approach will not take uh, much of our time. Uh, it it, it shares most of the principles of the anterior approach uh, with just some little uh, differences, uh, mainly the position, of course, and uh, the lesion that you're going to target. So with the posterior interhemispheric approach, the posterior part of the tentorial incisora can be exposed via the via sebra tentorial route. Uh, through this approach, the splenum, pineal gland, uh, mesencephalic tectum, upper part of the vermis can be reached. Uh, complex neurovascular structure can be overlocked, in, including the lateral veins, vein, vein uh, of gallon. Uh, branches of the posterior cerebral uh, arteries and uh, also uh, trochlear nerve. Those are uh, in this basic slide uh, most of the structures that can be approached through the posterior interhemispheric approach. Um, generally, uh, again and again, the post uh, the preoperative uh, consideration is careful study of the to me. Uh, by doing the in the MRI, uh, mainly the intra, internal cerebral vein and vein of uh, Rosenthal and uh, Gallen, and its relation, of course, to the pathology position, as we mentioned, it can be sometimes the same like supine approach, but I mean supine position, uh, uh, but mostly we use the lateral position with some neck flexion. Patient also may be positions in prone or semi-sitting position also as well. Uh, uh, also, there will be some uh, head to thorax uh, flexion elevation also uh, to prevent venous anatomy. We mentioned that also in the anterior interhemispheric approach. This is what we mentioned that the falks in the posterior approach can be, uh, I mean, uh, just with the tint. This is the incision. And here we have the tint and the false, uh, this uh, uh, illustrative picture. This is uh, the venous and vascular anatomy, like you can see, appreciate here the basal vein of Rosenthal. Um, also the endoscope also, we use it in these uh, surgeries to help us uh, intraoperatively. 
An extended posterior approach uh, plays the uh, sensomotor cortex at risk of uh, compromise. So further, uh, parasagittal vein should be as well preserved and it must. The exact location of the craniotomy is depends, you know, case to case and also uh, surgeon to surgeon. Intraoperative electrophysiological uh, monitoring and navigation are essential in those uh, kind of cases. Uh, sufficient sense of drainage as well. Uh, in the tumor surgery, the endoscope is also helpful. I mentioned that this is a case uh, that uh, uh, also we have done uh, with Professor uh, uh, Labidi. It's, it's for the resection of the cavernoma. You can appreciate here that this is the position, which is a part pinch position, lateral, uh, and this is uh, the incision. This is the interhemispheric approach again, but posteriorly and careful dissection of the uh, uh, arachnoid and preservation of the veins as well. Again, we are opening the files. We reaching to the posterior. Uh, what's it the most important here in the posterior interhemispheric approach that you gonna uh, do a, uh, an opening in the sclenium of the of the corpus callosum, and you know you try here is the uh, just when I explain this. I mean we are using sometimes the T seal. Uh, over the veins to preserve the venous structure and to prevent the veins from lagging, I mean, in, 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 in your uh, view during the surgery. So this is, is uh, you know, from our experience is a good and helpful uh, step. Uh, I was mentioned that the interhemispheric uh, or the callosotomy, uh, it should be minimal as much as you can because of the, uh, you know, disconnection syndrome that can be in the posterior callosotomy. Here we reached uh, to the cavernoma and we start debulking the cavernoma. Again, the three Ds, the debulking, dissection, and uh, removing of, of, the, of the lesion. For the sake of time, and try to accelerate the, vid the video. That is uh, now the wall of the cavernum has been also dissected carefully from the surrounding structure. We are using here the, the endoscope assistance to identify the walls, the anatomy surrounding to the lesion. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, if there is uh, hemostasis needs to be done before uh, ending up with uh, the surgery. And we could see here some residual uh, content of the cavernoma. But this, uh, we have uh, almost com uh, removed the lesion completely. Uh, endoscope uh, can tell you how, and this is the post-op uh, images. Pre-op and post-op images with the almost complete resection of the lesion. Okay, uh, this is the last slides uh, in this presentation. So um, anterior interhemispheric or posterior interhemispheric approach carries also some risk and complications, uh, which is uh, well known to most of the neurosurgeon, which firstly the venous infarction, it can be occur through the injuries of the superior sagittal sinus or uh, due to occlusion of large bridging veins. Uh, aggressive retraction of both single eye can cause a kinetic mutism. There have been suggestions that, you know, suctioning of the anterior aspect of the corpus callosum is not associated with severe symptoms, but sometimes uh, it, 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 it can, uh, you know, affect the spontaneity of the speech. Sometimes it's a temporary and sometimes, unfortunately, it 
gonna be like uh, permanent and might lead to the mutism. Uh, it's although it's re really rare in the anterior, but uh, it can happen. Posterior and uh, complete callosal sectioning has demonstrated with uh, post-operative behavioral abnormalities. Uh, severe pneumo, uh, pneumocephalus also can be happen. Uh, so we mentioned that you know before closure, you should like fill this uh, ventricular system with um, artificial CSF saline and um, watertight closure of the uh, dura. Uh, other uh, complication uh, known to everybody of you is CSF leaks, uh, you know, supplementary motor area syndrome, seizures, and uh, uh, subdural hemorrhage. Uh, I like also to share, and I'm always like what Professor Rotten says that success should mean giving every patient the feeling that she or he is cared about, no matter how disparate their situation, that their pain is felt, their anger is understood, and that we care and we will do our best for the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pali. That was an excellent presentation and good overview of intrahemispheric approach, both anterior and posterior and different cases you've shown. I request Professor Abhida Shah to please make some comments about Dr. Khalil's presentation and uh, your experience about uh, intrahemispheric approach in some personal things. Uh, Khalil, that was a very exhaustive presentation and in quite a detailed overview of the anatomy of the anterior and posterior interhemispheric approaches. And indeed, there are some approaches that we should all master because, you know, rather than going transcortical to approach ventricular lesions, it is always better to go transcalosal because you are going through less neural tissue. And unless you master the way you handle the veins, the way you enter the ventricles, you will not be able to, you know, understand this approach. And of course, the third ventricular anatomy is very important because you cannot injure the fornices as you will have some, you know, memory disturbances and a lot of, uh, you know, it will be a very aggressive course for the patient if you do that. I would like to tell you about your corp uh, corpus callosotomy. If you, you know, the direction of the corpus callosal fibers is transverse, so it connects on both sides. So instead of, you know, incise it vertically, you just splay the fibers, you will have a very good, uh, you know, you will not destroy many yeah. fibers. You just play the fibers. So you can try that next time. And uh, I think I would like to invite now Professor Carto for her comments. Thank you, Abhira. So the uh, the you mentioned about uh, the DTI. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe a, can you answer for her comment, uh, Kali? Thank you very much for a great. Yeah. Answer. Th thank you, Professor Kato. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Shah, with what she, what you mentioned is really interesting. Uh, you know, the closer to me, as much as you become like uh, you know smaller with your incision and uh, more anatomical as a better uh, outcome, of course. I do agree with what you said. Thank you, Khalil. I would like to invite uh, Professor Wozniak for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Khalil. Thank you very much. It's a very good, um, and my congratulations, very good uh, presentation, uh, very good uh, review and excellent videos. Uh, so, it's, uh, so thank you very much. But I have some comments because um, uh, this presentation, presentation was mostly dedicated to transcalosal approach, interhemispheric transcalosis, and uh, they are separated to anterior and posterior. But besides of this, we have two, another especially frontal interhemispheric approach, which uh, I used uh, for um, surgery of anterior communicating in, uh, artery aneurysm, and also for approaching third, third ventricle uh, uh, via laminar terminalis. 
It's also quite difficult. I use it in my practice, and the main challenge of this approach is um, adhesions between frontal lobes, which you cannot predict parasurgically. Sometimes, sometimes it could be uh, uh, quite uh, quite aggressive. It require quite aggressive uh, dissection. Uh, and then another one, the posterior or occipital, occipital parietal interhemispheric, it's uh, not so complex because usually in this uh, region you have no big uh, veins, uh, draining veins. Majority of draining veins are located in the frontal parietal uh, area. And, uh, it's, and it's, in this area, really, we must be very careful with the bridging, with the bridging veins. Um, what else uh, concerning uh, craniotomy? What I recommend and I do in my practice, I always uh, perform the both side uh, craniotomy and expose the uh, sagittal uh, sinus uh, sinus completely, completely, because it's easier to retract it, retract it first, and it's easier to repair to to put a stitch if you suddenly damage it. Um, and uh, my question is to you, do you consider in your clinic uh, transcortical approaches to the lateral ventricles or you always uh, go on the interhemispheric? Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, uh, Professor Ronzak for uh, your comments. I don't agree with what you said, um, uh, but in the most of the lit literatures, they include like the frontal and the occipital under this approach. So the frontal interhemispheric approach is considered one of the um, modalities or one of the subdivisions of the anterior approach. Uh, of course, it's uh, more helpful for the vascular stru structures. Uh, uh, for the uh, trans um, or combined approaches, the trans uh, cortical approaches, uh, um, it carries like uh, um, morbidities with like uh, seizures or whatever, but sometimes in, in some cases with, with the lesion like uh, extended more laterally, you might need it. But um, uh, I think with good positioning and with uh, uh, good dissections, uh, careful, uh, you know, review of the anatomy, uh, most of the third ventricular uh, lesions and lateral ventricles can be reached uh, by uh, interhemispheric approach. Uh, also, some some neurosurgeons they 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 prefer to go uh, ipsilateral or contralateral interhemispheric approach. Uh, so this is like surgeon to surgeon's uh, preference and experience. As much as you expert in this, um, uh, I mean, approach, uh, you will be able to lead to I mean to reach some deep 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 structures. Uh, this is for the, uh, you know, uh, question regarding to the interhemispheric uh, and um, transcortical, uh, uh, you know, routes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because uh, uh, I'd consider the transcortical approach for the last case of a neurocytoma. So you do, you could be more radical at this case if you used it, I think. And also I use transcortical when I plan uh, the subcoroidal uh, excess. To the posterior part of the ventricle, I also use the tra transcortical uh, approach. So thank you very much. Thank you. Exactly. At this point, exactly, we 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 use the endoscope to assess us for the you know, like deep uh, deeply seated lesions, and it shows like it it it, it helps us a lot to identify the remnants of the tumor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alexander Wozniak. Dr. Sharik there, Professor Sharik. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Very... Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent lecture. Uh, we learned a lot, but as you, the Professor Wozniak stated, said, the interhemispheric uh, uh, basal interhemispheric approach is very useful for removing uh, complex eicomandorisms because I have lots of experience with uh, eicomandorism. Uh, some posterior project and complicated echomandorisms can be managed uh, interhemispheric approach. So this is also very important for young neurosurgeons. Uh, and there's the positioning. Positioning, positioning is uh, very important because we usually position the patient uh, uh, prone position, usually. But uh, according to the gravity uh, theory, you can also use the uh, 
uh, other positions. Uh, it's also very important, but the preservation of uh, bridging veins is very important uh, during the interhemispheric, every interhemispheric approach from front to the posterior, anterior to posterior. So uh, preserving, you also manifested, demonstrated some techniques to uh, loosing, loosing, microsurgically loosing the attachment on the surface of the brain to uh, loosening the vein, tightened veins to uh, protect the bridging veins as was also important. So uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, concerning to the bridging vein anatomy, or what is uh, your preoperative planning? Uh, because you also mentioned uh, maybe contralateral approach uh, is uh, sometimes prevent uh, bridging vein damage, and uh, maybe it is uh, also very valuable to uh, approach from the uh, no bridging vein site. So what is your uh, concern and uh, experience about this? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Desna, uh, for your uh, valuable uh, comment. Uh, first of all, I do agree with you that positioning, positioning, and positioning is an important, not just in interhemisphere approach, in each, in all kind of approaches in neurosurgery. Uh, with gravity assisted, you could, uh, you know, save a lot of time and also uh, prevent your patient from getting some, uh, you know, um, complications. Uh, regarding to the bridging veins, uh, of course, the anatomy incision first, I mean, your uh, your uh, craniotomy and your landmark pre-op uh, gonna help you. Secondly, some neurosurgeons, they prefer to do, um, uh, you know, in the MRI, yeah, with the time of flights, I mean, the vascular uh, images can show you. Uh, uh, also, MRV uh, pre-op, if in the concerned cases, not like in, in each single case that you need to do an MRV or uh, uh, some vascular uh, uh, studies before op, but that uh, gonna help you a lot to, to identify your route and how safe it is. Uh, of course, intra-op, uh, you're gonna go like uh, in a safe corridors, neural navigations, and in the picture that I, I, I uh, I shared, uh, you could see that intraoperative neural navigation. We put the, uh, the, the image and we draw the uh, anatomical and the vascular structure pre op. So that also will guide you through the main bridging being that you try to up to during the surgery. So this is, uh, yes, of course, one of the pre operative uh, planning uh, step should be not overlooked. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And I do agree with uh, Professor uh, Wozniak in the, about the posterior uh, interhemispheric approach that there is no much bridging vein, but uh, the venous injury at the posterior uh, uh, you know, interhemispheric approach is really costly. Uh, also the other point, which is uh, important in the interhemispheric approach that the colostomy, you know, the, the splenium uh, colostomy should be minimal and uh, as much as you can, because it's not like in the, in the restroom. The splenium is carry the, um, a major risk of uh, disconnection syndrome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I see one hand raised by Dr. Ablai. Dr. Ablai, please introduce yourself and ask a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ablai Sirpai. Neurosurgeon from Kazakhstan. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Alfadasi, for such an interesting and informative uh, presentation. Um, I just uh, wanted to add uh, maybe some um, comments, and uh, also I have a question. Uh, firstly, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Wozniak that in Kazakhstan we do the same. We um, uh, make uh, two bur holes uh, classic, classically above. Uh, the superior sagittal sinus, but uh, we also open drill uh, not above the sinus, but uh, do uh, make a little bit contralaterally. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, it may be more safe and also it uh, help to retract the sinus. 
Uh, also, um, uh, I wanted to uh, add that uh, if concerning uh, the position of patient, if we, uh, if patient in supine position, um, maybe it, it might be uh, quite effective and helpful if uh, you use uh, rolled patties uh, and put it between hemispheres. Uh, I did it just once, but it um, helped me a lot. Uh, it it helps to avoid the retraction of uh, frontal lobe if you talk about uh, the anterior interhemispheric approach. Uh, and also, uh, did you have in um, in your own experience? My question: Did you have in your own experience um, such an complications as uh, mutism, mutism, and um, what about a visual uh, impairment during the posterior interhemispheric approach? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sarabai, uh, for your uh, valuable comment. Yes, uh, I do agree with you about the safety of uh, uh, the approach in the craniotomy stage. So it's it's surgeon to surgeon preference, but uh, uh, I really advise uh, for uh, this approach, which is more safer, like uh, you have contralateral uh, power holes, and uh, also bar holes above the sinus and try to dissect the sinus before going and also to start away and then you connect your craniotomy. That's, uh, that's uh, totally agree with that. Uh, in terms of uh, a complication that came across uh, our cases, uh, we, never, we never had like a case of mutism. Uh, I mentioned one case that uh, uh, we had uh, some uh, memory deficit, uh, a guy of about 35 years old, uh, you know, after the surgery, complete resection of the, of the uh, you know, at the beginning, we went like endoscopic uh, uh, approach. We were unable to take the whole um, colloid cyst. Then we went through the interhemispheric approach. Most of the patient has, uh, you know, a memory deficit. And uh, for that reason, we kept the patient about um, almost six weeks, which, was, which is really devastating for the patient because you cannot discharge such patient to uh, his uh, life back and he cannot identify, whereas, I mean, his people, I mean, family, the, he, he cannot back, go back to work. And uh, this is like a um, uh, uh, devastating, like post-op should be avoided, which is the phonetical injury. Uh, I think that was uh, one of the cases that uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, we never forget. Uh, so always uh, try, uh, to study the anatomy, try uh, not to mobilize or uh, injure the uh, furnaces, uh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Sarik Dr. Kishupa, you have a hand raised. You want to ask some doubts or some comments? Yes. Uh, thank you. Dr. Sachin, for the opportunity to contribute in this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Khalil, for this uh, presentation. It was uh, rich in content and uh, excellent in delivery. The uh, interhemispheric approach is commonly used in uh, intraventricular tumors. So I was just wondering, uh, do you commonly leave an EVD external ventricular drainage post op in these patients because there is uh, this risk of uh, post op bleeding following intraventricular tumor excision uh, secondly do you do a, um, a septostomy as a routine in interhemispheric transcalosal uh, approaches to intraventricular tumors. And uh, thirdly, uh, I've forgotten. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aniko, for your uh, comment. Yes, most probably in, I think most of our cases, we do the AVD. Yeah, I mentioned that in the presentation for one to two days post-op uh, yeah. to uh, prevent like, you know, most of the, the cases you will have uh, like uh, some remnant blood, 
so to avoid any uh, obstruction or uh, any uh, like post op unnecessarily uh, hydrocephalus yes of course we bought the EVD for one to two days we assess the patient we uh, we uh, I mean we club the EVD for 24 hours we do a CT scan if everything is straightforward we just remove it and the septostomy um, most probably yes we do it and it's an extra advantage uh, during the surgery will uh, I mean prevent your patients to to go back so uh, most of, uh, of our uh, colloid cyst and inter third ventricular lesions, we do a uh, septostomy. Yeah, we make it as a routine in our cases. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one more thing, sir, please. How do you repair the corpus callosum post op? Please, sir. How do you repair? Repair, yes, sir. You repair no. that access. You repair yeah, it or we, you leave it? We, we, we just like leave a piece of, of gel foam over the, of the, over the corpus callosum. Okay. And okay. We, we put sometimes some tea seal. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pikachu. Yes, Dr. Oraz, as a hand raised, Dr. Oraz, please introduce yourself and the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sachin. Dr. al -Kadassi, thank you for such a good, uh, interesting presentation. I just want to ask one question uh, about uh, your experience uh, uh, in pediatric craniopharyngiomas, uh, which in uh, intracellular part tumors. Have you used this technique or for that uh, type of tumors? Uh, thank you, Dr. Oraz. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, at our center, we, we are not dealing with a lot of pediatric cases, as we usually uh, we deal with, uh, you know, skull-based adult cases. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's still valuable, and also um, uh, it's surgeon uh, preference. Uh, they could use it with uh, assisted uh, endoscope. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, uh, implicated in the in those kind of surgeries, but uh, we we don't have a, like a, a lot of pediatric cases that we we do it. I mean, in this approach at our center here. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. I think please ask me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalil, uh, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, before asking a question, uh, I like to pay our tribute uh, from Neurosurgeon of Bangladesh to Professor Yoko Kato, ma'am, uh, for his tremendous contribution for the development of neurosurgery in Bangladesh. And uh, we had lots of memory with her uh, before uh, uh, of her visit before the COVID era in 2019. And hopefully, uh, we will see you again in Bangladesh very soon. And uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Khalil is that uh, sometimes uh, during intercellular approach, we face numerous uh, bridging veins. And it's, uh, it's tough to sacrifice all the bridging veins. Uh, do you practice uh, to work in between veins uh, during intercellular approach, uh, rather sacrificing, uh, sacrificing all the veins? And my second question is, uh, what's your comment uh, regarding gravity-assisted intercellular approach? What difficulties uh, uh, you faced uh, during interhemispheric approach uh, uh, of when we use gravity assisted? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Islam, for uh, your valuable uh, questions and comments. Uh, I mean, bridging veins, sacrificing all bridging veins, uh, I think this is, um, you know, devastating for the patient, and you might end up with. Uh, uh, major infarction. Uh, so we try to avoid that. Sometimes unavoidable small little bridging veins can happen. But again and again, surgical planning pre-op uh, is a manda is a, is a must to avoid such uh, you know uh, scenario. Uh, also, the, your craniotomy, your trajectory, uh, your allocation of the. Um, uh, uh, like what we mentioned, two third anterior to the um, uh, coronal suture. Uh, usually, those areas uh, is I mean having little bridging veins. 
most of the bridging rings is posterior to the um, uh, coronal sutures. So uh, if, if you are in doubt in, in, in your patient, uh, we mentioned that you might do some uh, MR wave that is available in your center to identify the anatomy. But it's like, uh, as, as Professor Amanu said at the beginning, practice and practice and practice. And as much as you do those cases, you will be more familiar with, uh, you know, with the anatomy and how to avoid uh, sacrificing the, uh, those kind of veins. For the gravity assisted, uh, this is also uh, one of the most important thing. It's like preoperative planning. So you, you, you should know where is your lesion. So in the basic lesions like uh, the foramen, the um, uh, colloid cyst, usually uh, it's straightforward. You, you're gonna go directly, but in, in the lateral lesions, you might need to change the position of the patients uh, accordingly. Uh, so that give you uh, good access to your lesion. Uh, we mentioned that try to avoid, uh, uh, I mean, uh, text retractions. Sometimes you need to extend your uh, uh, opening in the in the arachnoid. Uh, I mean, to extend a little bit anteriorly and posteriorly of the cingulum to give you a good exposure. But uh, as uh, as much as you go, uh, uh, the, the 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 route will be more clear and the corridor will be more open. Um, the also some modalities which is uh, the CSF uh, drainage pre-op. Uh, by like lumbar drain will give you also a good access to your lesion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalil. Thank you. Uh, anybody has any other comment or any question? Yes, Dr. Heba, please, please go ahead. Um, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the interhemispheric approach. Did you manifest or experience uh, disconnection syndrome in uh, any of your cases? And if there is any tricks to avoid it? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Heba. Uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, of course, it's it's well known complication. But if you if you follow uh, those steps that we mentioned. Uh, most probably you will not end up with this devastated syndrome. So we never been like through one of uh, our cases with disconnection syndrome uh, to avoid that again and again, which uh, you know uh, minimize the colostomy, uh, avoid uh, you know, uh, preserving of the I mean uh, uh, preserve sorry the the bridging vein and have a good. Um, you know, access good position and try to avoid injuring the uh, frontal lobe, uh, the garus, uh, the cingulum, and also the furnaces. So those like uh, fundamental and or what we call it take home messages uh, in this approach. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Heba, for participating actively. Uh, Dr. Kosaku Amano is there. Professor uh, Amano Sensei. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Professor, I'm so sorry I kept you waiting, but uh, may I request your uh, some comments about the presentation by Dr. Khalil about interhemispheric approach? Uh, um, maybe some comments by you uh, about this presentation. Uh, it's for young my, comment, my comment is. Uh, uh, Dr. Karkio uh, demonstrated the uh, interhemistic approach, but uh, I usually use the anterior interhemistic approach. So I opened here, not here. So I think uh, uh, now uh, demonstrated interhemistic approach is the transcarousal approach. Uh, no, no, trans, uh, not uh, different from my uh, interhemistic approach. So I rare to use uh, such approach. Uh, I mainly uh, nearly a transbasal interhemistic approach for the uh, side ventricle and the pituitary tumors. So to tell the truth, uh, I several uh, a few times I do uh, such a interhemistic approach. So <laughs> my comment is a little. Thank you very much, Uh uh, is there any other question or any comment from anybody? Uh, 
So if not, I will request uh, Professor. Yes, Dr. Chen, you will have some. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your uh, fantastic uh, uh, presentation and the very dedicated uh, um, explanation. And uh, I'm thinking, uh, can we combine endoscope in, uh, uh, make the approach in the IHA? I mean, we can use a transplant uh, tuber and uh, um, uh, draw into in, in the approach. And uh, then we needn't uh, hurt the uh, neurofibroid, just uh, uh, follow the fibroid pathway and uh, just uh, use the uh, tuber. Then the instrument uh, can um, cross the, the tuber to, uh, to uh, resect the tumor. <laughs> I'm thinking the combination. Uh, we use the uh, transplant tuber to make the approach. Maybe can um, make the lesion um, smaller and uh, expose the smaller, less uh, brain, brain, uh, brain tissue and uh, save time <laughs> to do the, uh, to make the approach, just to use a tuber, endoscope tuber. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Shen. Uh, always combined approach is uh, is there in neurosurgery uh, practice. Uh, it it's you, you know lesion to lesion. Sometimes in the vascular uh, structure, like in, in acom aneurysm, which is uh, sometimes if it's you know difficult to be approached by uh, interhemispheric approach. Uh, in some neurosurgeon, first vascular neurosurgeon, they use combined approach, like you go to renal through the sub. Uh, through the sylvian and also, I mean, more anteriorly, and you go also the interhemispheric approach. So you you're gonna reach in like the two lesions together. But this is like a rare. Uh, our presentation was concerned about the main fundamental, uh, you know, uh, aspect of the interhemispheric approach. But yeah, of course, you could use the uh, hybrid uh, approaches. Uh, using endoscope, using uh, different trajectory, and as Professor Amano, uh, you know, with his uh, great experience, he go more uh, more frontal, more anterior. Uh, yes, that's that's applicable, but it's case to case and legion to legion. It depends. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim, for answering all the questions. We have one more hand raised. We'll take one last question. Dr. Heba, please, please uh, ask the question. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Session. I have a question to Kusaku Sensei uh, about um, the craniopharyngioma. Um, you've mentioned that you could use intracranial procedure for calcified craniopharyngioma. So uh, I just want to know more about this because uh, uh, in, in Egypt and Children's Cancer Hospital in a calcified craniopharyngioma, our approach, if there's a small cyst, we can have an OMIA insertion and apply interferon injection into it truly or radiotherapy if the, if the kid is uh, older than three years old. So uh, can you tell me more about uh, what would you do in a, in a really calcified craniopharyngioma? Wouldn't you just leave it? Uh, putting in mind that di diabetes and uh, problem in, in Egypt, for instance, uh, could be very fatal due to sometimes uh, poor education in the family. So sometimes a kid could uh, come to the OR, to the emergency with a uh, hypernatremia, uh, like 150 something or 120 something. So this is a very crucial uh, uh, complication that we would avoid in any circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, that's very difficult case. You yeah. faced with that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, we cooperate with uh, endocrinologist. So such a uh, management of the hypernatremia and going on is uh, endocrinologist uh, managed. And uh, uh, I said uh, a very uh, calcified uh, craniopharyngioma, I used the uh, interhemistic approach. That, uh, at that time, I used a uh, uh, sonopet or something, uh, ultrasound uh, instrument. And, uh, but uh, the other thing, uh, you know, calcified region uh, not so getting uh, bigger and bigger. I think, uh, okay. yeah, 
so the uh, which region we must remove, which region we must uh, preserve, it's very difficult. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, very rare, but uh, such a uh, severe case, uh, actually, uh, we have to treat. That's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. I got the Three years old, three years old boy. Uh, in the craniofrain geoma, sometimes uh, uh, we, we see it in, uh, in this age group, yeah, so. And you said and, the interferon, you said the interferon you used, interferon. Yeah, we, we do uh, OMI insertion and then we can go for interferon injection, interleukin. Uh, I don't believe interferon for the craniofrain geoma. Okay. You should stop. You, should stop you recommend something different for the in, uh, chemo, chemotherapy injection in it, in the OMIA yeah. or? I have never experienced the interferon injection effective. I have never used, but the other hospital, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago in Japan, uh, many institutions used the interferon, but I have never interferon was effective. Okay. So, yeah. We should research but, one on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eba and Dr. Kosako uh, uh, if there are no other questions, then I think we've come to the end of the webinar. It was a wonderful webinar. I request uh, uh, first uh, person for today, Dr. Abhida Shah, to make some comments and Dr. Senjoko Kato to make some final concluding remarks uh, for today's webinar. Uh, first, Dr. Abhida Shah, please. Thank you, Sachin. I think we had a very, very ed educative webinar. Professor Amano was very good and his techniques of, you know, video techniques of dissecting the pituitaries and the craniopharyngioma were very good and gave us a good insight into the endoscopic transunital approach. And of course, Khalil has elaborately described the anatomy of the interhemispheric approach and showed some good videos demonstrating tumor removal. And I think it was a good session with some good discussions. So thank you very much for everything to everyone for this webinar and over to you Sachin. Thank you, thank you very much Dr. Uh, may I request Professor Rivoka to, to make some final concluding remarks and some encouragement for the young neurosurgeons before we close and before I make the final announcement. You are muted Prof, we can't hear you. Hey, thank you very much. The, the Professor Amano is eager to see the watch the world baseball team game. So if you, say, uh, you want to, to finish as soon as possible, I, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Amano Sensei. I think uh, the both lectures uh, based on the anatomy and also the endocrine, uh, the knowledge, and of course, the skill, and also the uh, devices. So the machine. So the, um, as a young neurosurgeon, I think you should learn so, so many things, so, but step by step, the, the, as uh, Amano said. And also, the, thank you very much for the great experience, the, the commentator, uh, the, Dr. Zarek from Kazakhstan, and also the regular commentator from the Alexander from the, the Ukraine. We are so proud of uh, two of them. And also, thank you very much for the YNS who attended so, for a long time. So we should meet maybe two weeks after. Sachin, uh, any uh, announcement? Yes, thank you. thank you very much, Professor. So I have a few announcements to make about uh, that. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. So uh, this is the first uh, announcement about our next ACNS YNS webinar. And uh, this will be on the 26th of March of this month. And uh, Professor Mas Mas Mar Masaru Hiro Hirohata will be the guest speaker. He'll be talking about the endovascular treatment for cerebral aneurysm. Uh, and the YNS speaker will be Professor Andrea Celenzi, who will be talking about the intraoperative uh, neurophysiological monitoring in case of vascular neurosurgery. So both very important topic for the vascular neurosurgery. So I request all the young neurosurgeons to come from this and be there uh, for our next webinar. Our next event will be uh, the major event of this year is the, the second World uh, 
Congress of Young Neurosurgeon, which will be on uh, 20th to 1st August, which will be uh, for the four days, and it will full of many workshops, the spine workshop, skull-based workshop, the microvascular, endovascular workshop, trauma workshop, and the anatomy workshop, and few life surgery, especially the functional life surgeries and glioma surgery. So at the bottom, uh, there's a link, uh, uh, the email address. So I would request all the young neurosurgeons to please uh, share your, send your abstract uh, for this uh, beautiful congress where you can participate in the workshop and you can present your workshop, present your abstract, present your uh, presentation and be the part of young neurosurgeon session. Uh, is Dr. Mirna here with us? Dr. Mirna from Indonesia, are you there? Will be in Surabaya, Indonesia, a beautiful place for all the young neurosurgeons who want to go for sightseeing also. And uh, one more educational activity will be in the month of September, from 15 to 17 September, ACNS Central Asia Silk Road Hybrid uh, Summer Webinar. Uh, so it will be in collaboration with the uh, uh, Neurosurgical Society of uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. And uh, it will be uh, held in Tashkent. So uh, it will have all the uh, workshops, especially the endocrine uh, workshop, the microvascular workshop. And uh, just now, Professor Yokogato has uh, told me that uh, Dr. Abhina Shah will conduct the glioma workshop and maybe some live glioma surgery. And Kosako Amano will also be there uh, to conduct the endoscopic uh, pituitary workshop. So that will be very great. Uh, so I request all the young neurosurgeons to please count on this, uh, the major educational activities of this year. So thank you very much, Shabri. Thank you very much. So I conclude that this is the end of today's uh, webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Arigato, Arigato. Thank you. Arigato.